There are sometimes in the astrophotography hobby where you just want a wide field, short focal length telescope that's easy to use and easy to move around. And I recently had one of those feelings. So I went to First Light Optics and asked them to send me one of these telescopes for review. And this is what they sent me, the Stellar Mirror 66ED. So this is a refracting telescope. And in this video, I'm gonna tell you my feelings about it after using it for some time. So straight off the bat, what I can tell you immediately is 66 millimeters in aperture, 400 millimeters of focal length, making this an F6 telescope. The ED, so it's got extra low dispersion elements on it, doublet telescope, so two lenses, the front one being that special ED lens. There is an optional 0.8 times reducer flattener, which will bring it down to 320 millimeters, which is then F4.5, something around that. I don't do maths very well. So onto that front ED element, because that's really the star of the show with these kind of telescopes. It is made of FPL 51 glass. Now, most people get really excited about FPL 53. That is kind of like the highest grade you can get for reasonable prices. But FPL 51 shouldn't be overlooked because of this. If you look on app diagrams and things like that, 51 is still relatively close and is of good quality glass. So it's not like 51 is down here and 53 is up here. It's still good glass. And indeed, it doesn't mean that there's any issues with color correction either. When I shot images with just broadband filters, with either an L-Pro filter or just UVIR cut filter, I found actually the colors were really nice. Build quality of the Stellar Mirror 66ED is nice as well. It's a lot of metals used in the construction of it. The dew shield has a nice tension to it. It doesn't just slide up and down on its own like I found with the Sharp Star I reviewed not too long ago. Focus is nice, but we'll get onto that in a bit. And it doesn't even weigh that much either. If you're looking just at the telescope out of the box, it only comes in around 2.3 kilograms or about five pounds. Now you would be hard pressed to find a mount that won't carry that, including star trackers. So it's very small, light and portable. Actually, the dew shield folds in quite far as well, making it easy to transport. And in fact, it's almost like the Stellar Mirror 66 is designed to be put onto things like Star Trackers. It comes with an L foot on it as standard rather than Vixen dovetails. So that would really bolt straight into these Star Trackers that we talk about. However, for me using it in an equatorial mount like that, that L foot really was a hindrance because you need a Vixen or a Lozmandy. So I actually ended up engineering some weird convoluted design where I used adapters and extra bolts to attach a Vixen to it. And I'm pretty sure there's a more easy way of going around this, but this is my solution and it worked. So yeah, if you wanna put it onto an equatorial mount, you're gonna have to supply your own Vixen dovetail for it. At the back of the telescope, we have a really nice rack and pinion type focusing system and it's a really good focuser. So rack and pinion, if you're not sure, like Crayford uses rollers to just move the focus rack in and out, whilst a, Crayf whilst a rack and pinion uses a rack and pinion. It's like a gear system. It's a much more positive lock that can lock a lot better and handle more weight. It's more secure with less flex in it. It's a really good focuser with a 10 to one fine tuner on it as well. And the focus lock underneath, I can't get to it because of my engineered solution. The focus lock is good as well. And it also has rotation in it in case you need to reframe after getting focus. It's just a really nice focuser I found. And even with a small telescope like this one, this focuser, I've had a ZW 533 mono with a filter wheel and an autofocuser hanging off and things like that. And I know that's not the heaviest camera package in the world, but there was not a single bit of droop or flex. It was solid, really good. The other thing I did notice though, is because I've had to add this dovetail onto it, and maybe I could have positioned it a bit better, but because I've had to add this dovetail onto it, the rotator actually strikes, would strike the dovetail. So I can't use the rotation to its full potential, but you know, it's kind of nice to have. Going back to this retracting dew shield I talked about earlier, when you actually have it all pulled together in transport mode, let's call it, the entire telescope's only 315 millimeters long. That's about 12 inches. But when you ex 
extend the dew shield all the way, we're now looking 375 millimeters, just under 15 inches. So there's actually a decent amount of movement in here and you can see it's not going anywhere. I can, I can shake this, let's get that cap off. I can shake this and there is some play in it, but it's not rolling back down the tube on its own merit. So a lot of good tension in it and decent movement for protecting from dew and stray light. Another thing to take account of, considering this is a small portable telescope that you'd probably put on Star Trackers or for outreach, is at the back here, it doesn't actually come with a finder shoe as standard. There's a mounting point for it. There's these little grub screws that you can undo with an Allen key and then fit a finder bracket if you want to, but it doesn't come with one as standard. So I had one that I was laying around, so I was able to fit it. But if you need a finder shoe for a finder scope, guiding, or like an ASIR Plus, Plus or something like that, you need to supply your own. They aren't expensive by any measure. They're probably like five pounds, but it can be an inconvenience that you have to supply your own. So just factor that in as well. There's no finder bracket as standard. So let's talk about the suitability of this telescope. So at native 400 millimeters or reduced 320 millimeters, we're looking at wider field imaging. Depends on the camera you actually pair it with. Like I said, I put a 533 camera on it, which is a small sensor, a 2.7 crop factor sensor. So I had a much narrower field of view. However, if you are using this on Star Trackers and you're putting something like an APS-C DSLR onto it, then yeah, you've got some nice wide field of views going on there. Now those pixel sizes compared to this focal length will probably cause under sampling issues, which is great for tracking and guiding performance, but you do lose some finer details. Though what I understand for basically the majority of the community, they don't mind a little bit of loss of fine details, especially at wide field of views. You normally at a wide field like that, you're admiring an entire scene rather than picking fine details out of a nebula or a galaxy. So to me, that's not a deal breaker either. And even when I was using the 533 camera reduced down to 320 millimeters, if you look at the chart, it's still got some undersampling on it. In practice, when I looked at my nebulae, I looked at my images, I didn't see anything concerning at all. So at a certain point, theory breaks down, practicality takes over, and it just worked. I really liked the image that I was getting. The imaging circle of this telescope, whether you use reducers or not, it doesn't support full frame sensors. So 1.5 crop factor sensors like Nikon, DSLR, or dedicated cameras like the O71 or 2600 is the biggest you're gonna be able to go before you start getting vignetting. However, I don't know many people using full frame cameras. There are some full frame telescopes out there, but they're not at this price point. So APS-C or smaller is the sensors you'll be using with this telescope. And if you do fit an APS-C sensor on it, like a Nikon 1.5 times crop factor, then you can easily fit things like M31 the Andromeda Galaxy into one entire frame. You could almost fit the entirety of the elephant's trunk nebula in there. M32 Orion Nebula with plenty of room to spare, and you could get the entirety of the Heart Nebula or the Carina Nebula in the field of view. Now, these are all quite large targets that you can fit in the field of view of this telescope. That just shows the power sometimes of wide field imaging, and I would argue that these wider shots sometimes have more impact than an extremely zoomed in image of a galaxy or a nebula. It all depends on taste. Of course, I would always recommend you go into something like Stellarium or Astronomy Tools and put your camera in and this telescope in and just explore your favorite targets to see what kind of field of view you're going to get before you commit to any sort of purchase. The last thing I want you to do is get bitten by the field of view that you're not happy with because of a recommendation from me or a video from mine. So. I always recommend doing a bit of independent research with your field of views. And during my time with this telescope, there's been a couple of niggles that I found. Mainly, like I said, engineering this dovetail solution was a pain. It was something I wasn't expecting to do, completely slipped my mind, but I was able to get something sorted. Again, this is probably not the most straightforward way of fixing this. It's just what I had in my toolbox at the time. And because it's on this puck and where I've had to mount it, the rotator is completely superfluous at this point because I can't rotate it any more than 
15 degrees, so a bit useless uh, in this configuration. And the focus lock for the focuser itself, whilst brilliant, it's a rather large focus lock and it got in the way of where I wanted to put my electronic autofocuser. Now I was able to mount the EAF, it was at a bit of a weird angle, the bracket was going this way rather than on axis to the, on the uh, focus tube here, but it still worked perfectly fine, it just looked a bit weird, <laughs> but it still worked. And those are really the biggest niggles I found with quality and use, like quality of life with this telescope. Otherwise it was relatively easy to live with. Actually there is one more niggle of mine and I do not understand this rationale of manufacturers not putting finder shoes on their telescopes. The Sharp Star 61 EDPH2 was the same. Small portable wide field telescope didn't have a finder shoe. The Stellamira 66 here, small portable wide field telescope doesn't have a finder shoe. Now under the assumption that this telescope, which is being marketed for astronomy purposes, is going to be used for astronomy purposes, we need finder shoes. They are useful for a variety of reasons. Yeah, if you're using this for visual and you put like a big old 30 millimeter eyepiece on it, you have a very wide ocular, yeah. But a finder shoe just helps, especially for astrophotography because you need a guider on it. So I am kind of moaning about a very, very cheap accessory to add on to this telescope, but just put it in the box. Give us the option to begin with rather than having to buy an optional extra. Just a thought. Now, how much did this cost? At the time of this review, the telescope itself comes in at a modest 369 pounds just for the scope. And it's 79 pounds for the 1X non-reducing flattener. But if you do want the reducing flattener, the 0.8, it's 89 pounds. There is a 0.6 times reducer flattener available, but I've not used it, so I'm not really gonna discuss it here. But it is there, it is available and that would really turn this into a beast of a wide field telescope. However, with that semi-cathartic rant about finder shoes out of the way, I actually think despite the few niggles I found with this telescope, the benefits actually outweigh the cons. It is a small telescope that can easily fit in a backpack, fit on a star tracker if you go into a nice dark site or you're hiking up a mountain or whatever it is you get up to in your free time. It can fit in a small carry case which actually comes with a carry case as well. Very good quality glass in it, FPL 51. Yes, it's not 53, but I've found no problems with it and a very nice build quality. So that's it, that's the review. Thank you very much for watching. Give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed this or give it a thumbs down if I could have done better and consider subscribing for more reviews such as this. And let me know down in the comments below, are you in the market for a nice wide field telescope with a beautiful focuser and good quality glass? Drop me a comment down below, any questions as well, I'll be there to answer. With all that said, it's time to say thank you very much for watching. Hope you have clear skies. Keep looking up, keep them cameras clicking. I'll see you later.